Uh, did we finish it or? I think we, yeah, we finished finish it. iron two chloride plus sodium phosphate. So we're on number seven now. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, number seven. Take a look at that. So, what do you call the first? Uh, is that aluminum or aluminum ion? Just aluminum. Yeah. Aluminum solid, liquid, or gas? What's this HCl? Hydrochloric acid. Good. Hydrochloric acid. Uh, you don't want to mix aluminum with hydrochloric acid. Let's say if you have a, like aluminum bicycle and you use hydrochloric acid to clean it, um, the hydrochloric acid is going to eat it away. It's going to eat it away because this um, follows a format. And the format is this one here. This is an element plus a compound, and it's called uh, single replacement. So we have um, three patterns that we're looking at here. There are more of the three pattern reactivity. And so what we say is this is the A plus BX pattern. And what does it form? Well, we look at the pattern here, and the pattern is going to form AX here plus B. So we have to look at um, what these are. A is just aluminum. Aluminum. B is what? Well, B is the cation. The cation is H. And what's the charge on H? Plus. And then Cl has what charge? Negative. And that would be hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is one of the big acids you should know. Okay, so what we're going to form is AX. And so X doesn't change. X stays chloride. It's chloride ion. And so we're going to form aluminum chloride. That's what we should form here. Aluminum chloride. But it's a little bit tricky because what's the charge on aluminum here? Zero. But you know in aluminum chloride what the charge on aluminum will be? What's the formula for aluminum chloride? So what I'm asking here is, is this. When we take a look at and analyze this, we go from the element to the cation. In order to go from the element to the cation, we have to lose electrons. And so aluminum is going to go from aluminum metal to aluminum cation. What's the charge on aluminum cation? Well, we take a look at the periodic table and see, is that a variable charge or a fixed charge? It's fixed charge, and the charge is going to be plus 2. So, but what we have, we should double check. You all agree? Aluminum, well, where is aluminum position? Aluminum is here in group 3 or 13. It has 13 electrons. So if it loses two of the 13 electrons, it's going to be the same as sodium with 11 electrons. So does it want to go to 11, or does it want to go to 10? It wants to go to 10, so it's going to lose not two, but it's going to lose three. And so um, when we go from the element to the cation, so this aluminum is going to be three plus here. Mm -hmm. 
And then chloride stays the same. Chloride doesn't change. And so what would be the correct formula for aluminum chloride? AlCl3. So we'll form AlCl3, aluminum chloride. And so when it goes from a, uh, an element to a cation, did it lose electrons or did it gain electrons? It lost them. But who did it lose the electrons to? And so um, we take a look here, and then B goes from the cation to the element. And so what is elemental hydrogen? Well, it would just be H, wouldn't it? With no charge. But does H like to be alone, or does it pair? It pairs, so it's going to be H2. And so aluminum lost electrons. Who didn't lose it to? It lost it to H+. So H+, we call the oxidizer. And aluminum um, is called the reducer, or the fuel. It's a fuel that has electrons in the top. Fuels will have electrons in the top. Those electrons are going to go to the oxidizer. And the oxidizer is going to take those. And so this is going from aluminum to aluminum 3 plus. And this is going from H plus to H2. I'm not balancing it quite yet. Uh, let's balance it uh, now. So, I look over here, I have three chloride here, I have one chloride here. So I can multiply this one by three. Let me do that. That's going to give me three hydrogens, but I have two hydrogens here. I can't change that to three. But a quick thing we can do is just go three halves. Three halves times two gives us three. And then one aluminum. So that's balanced now. Um, some people don't like fractions. Sometimes they're not as convenient as whole numbers. And so to get rid of the fraction, we'll just multiply everything by two. So we'll get two aluminum solids plus six HCl. This is going to produce two AlCl3 plus three H2 gases. And that should be balanced. H2 is a gas, I know that, but what is HCl? Is it a solid, liquid, gas, or aqueous? When we have acids, they're usually aqueous. Aqueous just means dissolved in water. If there's water present, then aluminum chloride actually dissolves in that water too. Aluminum chloride is normally a white solid. You know, all ionic compounds are solid, and some of them are, some of them are what we call soluble. Water soluble meaning they dissolve in water. Hydrogen is not water soluble. If we boil hydrogen, it bubbles out as a gas. When something bubbles out, we call it what? When something bubbles, forms bubbles, we call it... Hmm? It's kind of carbonation, but the, the carbonation is usually referring to CO2, but this is not CO2. This is hydrogen. So you wouldn't call it carbonation or carbonated. Hmm? Yeah, it outgasses, sometimes we'll say that, or... Well, outgassing is usually a physical process, you know, where, where you have a gas that's absorbed in something and then you're losing it. And so it's not really outgassing. We have another name for it. Anybody recall the name? In a way, yeah.
Is it not that? Yeah, well, knock out is not really the word for it. There's another one. Um, nobody remember? Like this. Oh. Yeah. Oh. This one started with a P. This one started with a P. Do you remember this one? What this is Precipit called? Uh, yeah. Precipitation. Precipitation. Good. Now this one. Do you remember that one? Hmm? Not evaporation. Evaporation would be, you know, water for me. This is not water for me. Not emulsification. Not emulsification. This isn't boiling here. This solid generating gas. Yeah. That's what it says, but that's um, that's one of the ways I called it. But I, I gave it a name. Does anybody remember the name? Maybe I didn't. I mean, it was two days ago, so one. You, you definitely gave it. So <laughs> I gave you the name, but you you might have forgotten. Or two, I. Forgot to give you the name. I don't remember which it is. But I'm pretty sure I gave you the name because I always use that name for this particular process, but it was two days ago. Yeah, but I remember you saying the precipitation, and then you said the other two, which I don't remember. You don't remember, but you do remember me saying something? Yeah, you did yeah. say something. Because you said it right after precipitation. Right. After precipitation. This is precipitation. This is. E F E F does that effervescence. effervescence that's it effervescence effervescence um yeah maybe you, you didn't see a, a video on effervescence or something or you didn't see it actually effervescence effervescence is very common um. And so we have to use that. But the, that got me thinking. You know, effervescence is give off both. Effervescence. Effervescence. This video, the qualities of that, I don't understand why they didn't do that. Well, anyway, that, that got me thinking because there's a lot of memorization in chemistry. And um, don't wait, you know, don't wait until last minute. So for, for example, ever, effervescence, well, you might not have caught it, so you might not know, but it would be good, you know, in case something like that came up. Um, it is, uh, you might say, well, it isn't exactly fair if it's not in the textbook, but what I found was, um, I found, uh, that a lot of the tests I had were nothing like the homework, nothing like the book. A lot of the tests I had, um, not, you know, every single question, you know, there are a lot of questions that are like the homework and like the book, but all the tests that I took, there's always you know, one or more questions that were nothing like the homework, nothing like the, the text. And so what do you do with a question like that? How do you answer a question like that? So a lot of people might say, well, it's not fair, but 
no one would listen to that. You, know? you could say it's not fair, it's not fair, but they don't really care. And so the way you answer questions like that is um, you go through and you um, know all the basics. So this is why I recommend like reviewing. Reviewing this stuff every day if possible. If you can review this stuff every day, then you know that solves a lot of your memorization issues because that way you kind of uh, makes it easier to memorize you know, rather than doing it on occasion. And um, that brings me back. The person who holds the world record in memory has a course. It's just an online course. I took it. And even with a person, the person didn't have a photographic memory because, you know, how can you teach a photographic memory? You can't teach that. The person didn't have a photographic memory. And so the person, this person said that the way you remember things is you review them. So initially you have to review them every day. And so you go back through every day. But after a while, it becomes, okay, if you do the same thing every day, you'll remember it. And then you might forget about reviewing. But he said, don't do that, you know. After you review it every day and then you have it all memorized, then you can increase the, um, the time between reviewing to, let's say, weekly, you know, once a week or maybe twice a week. And then from there, once a month. And then from there, quarterly. So he said that if you really want to remember this stuff, you review it at least quarterly after you've had it you know, memorized. And so he's, you still have to do that. Otherwise, you'll forget. There's a lot of stuff I don't use anymore, and I've completely forgotten. But um, that happens. So that would be like effervescent, you know. Um, if you had that word in your notes, the, how would you remember? You could you could look at it the night before the test you know, and see what effervescence is. But it's hard to memorize a bunch of material right before the test. So don't wait. So this would effervesce, but it's going to effervesce hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas, this is potentially explosive, so this is a dangerous reaction. And you have to watch out because you could have a hydrogen explosion when it mixes with air and combust. And so aluminum is easily attacked by an acid like hydrochloric acid. You might think, you know, why, if it's not in this chapter, would you be tested on it? Well, I thought the same, because I, when I started at uh, UCLA, when I transferred there, I just thought I'd just study the book. And the book is good enough. The book has everything, but the book doesn't have everything. and certainly didn't have the focus on the test. So I ended up um, struggling. First quarter, it's a big struggle. I had to study all along. But well, finally fixed that. And so, you know, I'm going to do all right. Okay, let's see. What's next? Eight. This, is a, this was a single replacement. Eight is going to be a different one. Eight is going to be what's called decomposition. This is going to be decomposing to the element. So what is that compound there? HGO. What do we call that? Mercury oxide. Um, mercury oxide would be fine um, as long as mercury is a fixed charge. Is mercury fixed charge or variable charge? It's right here in the product field. Fixed charge and variable charge. It's variable. In fact, all these elements down here, you know, across, are variable charge. All these elements except for three of them, which three? Zinc, 
Nickel variable. Zinc, cadmium, and silver. Zinc, cadmium, silver. Even though mercury is in the same family as zinc and cadmium, it's variable charge. What are the charges, the common charges for mercury? Plus four, plus two. Mm -hmm. so it's a way to predict it. You know, um, not this periodic table is not as easy to predict. It's very easy to predict it. Actually, you don't really predict it. Just look at the periodic table. Hopefully, you have a periodic table that looks like. Hope you have a periodic cable that looks like that. Here. This is a periodic cable numbering system that I like. The one, remember that other one? The other one called this A. We don't usually call this block A, we call this block B. And the A block is over here and here. A, A stands for main group. And so when we have an A here, this, these are called main group elements. And then B, um, in this case, stands for the transition elements here. So this the B block. And when we look at the numbering here, um, what group is mercury in? Group 2B. So I know one of the charges of mercury, the max charge, has got to be plus 2. If the max charge is plus 2, what's the other charge? 1. And so it's 1 and 2. In fact, this group, uh, silver we know as, as, as plus 1. Copper would be, what, plus 1 and plus 2. So it's in this 1-2 block here. Um, the only problem is gold. Gold is 1 and 3, but oh well. Kind of works out, but not perfectly. And so, is this mercury one or mercury two oxide? Because it's variable charge, we have to indicate what the charge is. So, mercury one or mercury two oxide? Two. Mercury two. How did you determine that it was mercury two? Oxygen is two. Oxygen is minus two. yeah two minus two. So mercury mercury is plus two and oxygen is minus two. And then um, all ionic compounds are solid, but some of them will dissolve in water and form vapors. Mercury is not one of them. Mercury oxide won't dissolve in water. Okay, what will this form? This is what we call uh, decomposition. What we're going to do is we, we're going to take a compound and decompose it into elements. And so we can separate compounds into the elements using physical separation or chemical separation techniques, or both. Wait, where did you get the uh, negative two from? Like by looking at this angle. Oxygen is always negative two. No, how many electrons does oxygen have? It has eight electrons. It's pretty small, but that's right off the periodic table. Okay. It's eight. Neon has ten, so get to go from eight to ten, it needs two electrons. So uh, mercury 2 oxide, to separate it into the elements, will require chemical separation. Physical separation won't work. Physical separation methods work for mixtures, not compounds. And so if we have um, uh, some chemical separation technique, then we'll need some kind of energy or something, chemical separation.
technique, we might be able to decompose it into the elements. What elements would it form? It formed the element. Mercury. And what's the charge on elemental mercury? Two plus or one plus. Yeah, um, mercury ion would be two plus or one plus, but the element will be neutral. It won't have a charge. This would be liquid mercury, like in the barometer, plus elemental oxygen. What's the charge on elemental oxygen? Zero. And, uh, does oxygen like to be alone, or does it like to pair up? It's diatonic, so we'll have that, and it's a gas. So in this case, what's going to happen is mercury is going to go from a cation to the element. So is mercury gaining electrons? Because we're going from mercury 2 plus to mercury 0. Is it gaining electrons or losing electrons? It's gaining, right? It's gaining. And who's it taking the electrons from? From the oxygen. From the oxygen. But that's the opposite of normally what happens, because oxygen is going to lose to form oxygen with a zero. In fact, if we do the oxidation states, we'd, we'd write them like this. The oxidation states, we'd write plus two, minus two, zero, and zero. We have two oxygens, each oxygen is at zero charge. And so basically, um, what's happening here is the mercury 2 is what we call oxidizing the oxide here. That's usually the opposite because oxygen likes to oxidize metals to form metal oxides. And so therefore, we're going to need some kind of chemical separation technique for this to happen. And we're going to, probably going to need some energy because forming oxide. <laughs> Mercury, though, is hard to oxidize. So. Did you say heat could do it? Heat can do it for a lot of things. So probably if we heat this up, um, I think heat can probably do those. But not always. Some things get a little more difficult. All right, how can we balance this? Uh, well, we have one mercury, one oxygen, so we can go one half here. But if you don't want fractions, then we'll double the whole thing. So if we double the whole thing, we get two mercury oxides, mercury two oxides, two mercuries, and one oxygen molecule. Uh, and that should be balanced. Oxygen is a good oxidizer, so this is much more favored than the first, perhaps, for most of us. So, this is an example of a redox decomposition. Redox is whenever we have the electrons. The last reaction we did was an example of a redox single replacement reaction. So, let's look at the next reaction. This is an example of a redox combination. If you have a metal, metals tend to be oxidized like iron. And so I'm trying number nine. Let's see what we got. Number nine. Essentially, both of you are right. We would expect iron 2 oxide and iron 3 oxide to form. Ultimately, though, um, we would go to which one? If I, if I formed iron 2 oxide, eventually I would think it would end up at 
more oxygen. It would end up at iron three oxide. Why? Does the iron have a variable charge? Iron has a variable charge. Two and three are the common charges for iron. Right. And the reason I would think it goes to iron three is because oxygen is still going to be attacking iron, trying to take the electrons from iron. It's going to go to iron three. Um, iron four is not probably not likely because iron four is not that stable. It's kind of a high charge. And so, what do we do? Do we write multiple? You have two choices here. One, you could write multiple products. This is what we're going to form. It's like this. When you burn methane, what can you form? If you burn methane, you can form carbon, which we call soot. In water. But you can also form other stuff. What else? Hopefully we don't form lots of soot, because if you form a lot of soot when you burn methane, it's going to turn everything... What? It's going to turn everything... Sooty, yeah. It's going to turn... I mean, we're going to... You're going to get soot coating everything. You want soot coating everything? Sometimes. No. Well, yeah. Yeah, graphite, if you like. Yeah. Hopefully it burns a little bit more, but then we don't want to form this, do we? Carbon monoxide? No, we don't really want to form carbon monoxide either. Hopefully you can adjust this, the flame, to not produce much soot, not to produce much carbon monoxide, but hopefully mainly carbon dioxide. Even though carbon dioxide has a very bad name um, right now, that's much less toxic than carbon monoxide. And then soot, soot's not bad. But um, well, anyway, uh, we don't want a really smoky flame, so carbon dioxide would be best. So should we write all three of these each time we combust methane? Do we? No, ultimately we're going to form you know, if we add enough and this is properly, properly done, ultimately we should form carbon dioxide. So normally when we, when we do methane combustion, we ignore these two, even though those two can form, right? No problem with forming those. If they're easy to form. And so here, when we have multiple choice, choices that, that are all okay, and probably what we should do is we just insist saying, let's just go ahead and oxidize this all the way. What's the common name for this? Iron 3 oxide has another name. Rust. Rust. Yeah, we might as well just go all the way to rust. And so this is correct. It's nothing wrong with that. Just like carbon and carbon monoxide are correct, but when we're doing these reactions, we don't want to do all these variations of things. We'll just go ahead and take it. It's like simplifying your answer in that, sort of? Yeah, sort of. You know, we're trying to make our life easier. Sometimes, for sure, it forms, like, you know, copper. Well, actually, we could do both. We could do both. We have iron, solid. Making iron two oxide. Well, how do you balance that? Add a two iron oxide and a two iron. Yeah. If we had iron going to iron three oxide. How would we balance it? Four here? Four on the iron on the left. Four on the iron. And then two on the iron oxide. And then two on the iron oxide. And how many oxygens? Three. Okay. Oh, and that looks good. So we can balance it like that. No fraction. Same thing happens with pennies. Have you ever uh, looked at pennies, like a brand 
penny. Brand new penny is pretty shiny. This is fairly new, pretty shiny. But as it gets older, what happens to the color? It starts to turn what color? Green. Oh, greens because of sulfur. Let's say there's not a lot of sulfur in the air. We just want the oxygen to be reacting. And so when pennies get a little older, they turn what color? Not the green. The green is just a lot of moisture. Dark brown. Brown, right? They start to turn darker brown. Kind of. We can speed that up by heating it up. And so I might go from a shiny penny to a kind of a brown penny. You see it's starting to discolor. It's starting to get brown, a lot browner. You know what that brown color is from? Yeah, oxidation. And uh, that brown color is from forming... Now, copper is variable charge. And so what are the two charges on copper? The common charges on copper. One and two. And so um, it starts to form copper one oxide. What's the formula for copper one oxide? Copper one oxide. The formula for copper one oxide is well, copper one is Cu plus. Oxide is O two minus. Two minus. We need how many copper plus? We need two. And so what's the ratio? The ratio is two coppers to one oxygen. Two to one ratio. This is the brown. And so we form copper one oxide. But have you ever looked at really old pennies? You know what color really old pennies are? Black. Have you seen black pennies before? Yeah, really dark. It's not from the soot. You could try to rub it off, but it's actually a compound. You know what it is? Oh, this my penny's starting to melt, but do you see it's starting to turn black? It's actually my penny. You know what um, is inside the middle of pennies? Zinc. Zinc has a low melting point. Copper has a much higher. My copper's not melting at all, but my zinc just melted. <laughs> I have molten zinc there. You see that molten zinc? That's probably cool enough to touch you now. And so this this is zinc here. Um, actually, uh, this there's barely any copper. This is why it melted so fast. Copper pennies used to not do that. I've done this many times. So the older copper pennies would last a lot longer. These new copper pennies, it's probably, it's still probably got more than a penny's worth of copper. You know? Zinc is not that expensive. This is zinc. Zinc is not variable charge. What is zinc? Fixed charge at two. two. But this is elemental zinc. So elemental zinc has no charge. So, um, that's the copper one oxide, which is brown, but eventually it's going to turn into what? With more oxygen, it's going to turn into copper two oxide. What's the formula for copper two oxide? This is copper one oxide. Here. We call it red. This is copper two oxide. It's black. This is um, 
this is there's some sulfur in here. Mm -hmm. There's copper one oxide. You can tell there's a copper one oxide that's on the CU2. They call all these copper oxides. And if you get copper oxide, which one are you getting? Are you getting copper two or are you getting copper one? You need to know. Because they're different colors. So copper two oxide formula is Cu. So if we're going to do this, do we want to write multiple equations for multiple products? No, we're just going to go. You know, eventually that penny's going to. The copper two oxide. Yeah. So right there. Right. Right. So we're going to just write copper two oxide. You know, when we have a choice here, we're just going to go into the higher oxidation state. You know, that doesn't always happen, but, you know, it's going to be easier than having to write every single combustion reaction that can take place. The combustion reaction forming soot, the combustion reaction forming carbon monoxide, the combustion reaction forming this. And so what we'll do is if we're going to oxidize copper, we're just going to oxidize all the way to copper two. And so we're going to form copper two oxide. And so how will we balance this? We can use a fraction here. So one copper, one copper, two oxygen, one oxygen. So we'll cut this one in half. Or we can just double everything. We we'll double everything, then we'll get two coppers, one oxygen, two copper two oxide. And give us nice clean whole numbers. Or G. That's, that's too solid. So copper metal, oxygen gas, copper two oxides is solid. I thought it was a fire, so I was confused. Okay, um, how about uh, trying number 10? There. Can you do number 10? Number 10 is a different pattern. They call it, it's the same pattern as 2 and 6. Do you know what we call that pattern? Okay. Double replacement. And with double replacement, we just swap the anion. So if I look, I have cation A with anion X, cation B with anion Y, and so we'll just swap the anion. And so A is going to go with Y now, and B is going to go with F, and that's it. It's called double replacement, just replacing both anions. Double replacements are easy to predict. Um, how would you name the first one here, Fe2SO43? Is that di, di iron tri? No, we don't use those uh, di tri tetra with ionic compounds. This is ionic compounds. Compound of ion, metal and non. We call that what? Iron 3 sulfate. How did you figure out it was iron 3? the sulfates add up to 6 minus, which is net charge of the three sulfates, and then we have two irons. Both irons have to add up to plus 6 because the compound's neutral. There's no charge. And so to add up to plus 6, each of these has to be 3 plus. So that's good. But um, if that's a bit much, do you know there's a shortcut way that works? But not, not for everything. The shortcut way that works is take the subscript here and use that as a charge here. It doesn't always work, but sometimes it, it works nicely. So, for example, this wouldn't work for this here because we would assume, well, it's a one to one. So we just turn plus one and minus one. 
But in this case, it does work here. Um, because iron would be plus 3, and sulfate would be minus 2. Because sometimes this works, so it's helpful. Now, we have to be careful because there are exceptions. How long did it take to tell if it does work and say if we did it on the exam and for us to get an answer to it? Let me know that. Um, you would know it's wrong because uh, you would have to know a little bit more. So if we applied it to this, one and one, we get copper one, which is not a problem. Copper one exists. So that wouldn't throw up any flag. What would throw up a flag is O minus. Have you ever seen an O minus? No. And so that would throw up a flag that maybe this is wrong. Um, o minus does kind of exist, but not in this form. O minus does exist as O2, 2 minus. But this is not O2, 2 minus. This is just O. And O2, 2 minus is called, it's one of the ides you have to memorize. Peroxide. Peroxide, more than other ides that you have to memorize. O2, 2 minus. Hydroxide, OH minus. One more. One more I. Cyanide. Cyanide. Yeah. Cyanide is C N minus. The other reason for going through these every day is um, so you can build, a, you know, a, what they call like a neural network. Have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. Neural network. I went to a talk at UCLA right before the lockdowns, and um, they had this physicist guy. And the physicist guy, he was just into pure physics, like theoretical physics and stuff. And then he, he was he got interested in biology. And so he built this thing. He built this thing where he could listen to the neurons, the synapses, clicking because it's electrical signal, and he knows how to measure electrical signals. And so it was pretty, pretty amazing talk because you could hear the like the brain, the brain, the cells in the brain talking and communicating with one another. It's so weird. And he had the audio. I tried to bring up the audio because I think it's online, but I couldn't find it. I was looking for it this morning. I'll have to do that. Um, I'll, I'll bring that in because it was kind of pretty cool. Neural signal processing. Oh, this is a lot. Um, he also talked about how many uh, connections there are with each neuron. Do you know how many connections there are? A lot. Is it a hundred synapses for each neuron? No, it's more. No, I think it was in the tens of thousands. I think, I, as I recall, it was like 32,000. A little. But anyway, he, he was measuring this, and then you could hear it you know, it's, as his own communication language. He said it was real time. Like, you can listen to it, click, 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 click. And I was thinking, is that real time? It seems kind of slow if it were real time, but he said it was real time. That's pretty cool. It's a... A field of neuromorphic computing that I'm interested in on the electrical engineer. Oh, yeah. And uh, the material, you know, because we have a chip shortage. Mm -hmm. And I thought the chemistry we had that was really interesting. Um, yeah, the, this whole thing was pretty interesting for the use. This is interdisciplinary, interdepartmental. 
So we have physicists, biologists, engineers working on this. And um, this is the main Oh, Meta. Yeah, this is the talk I want to give. My aunt is Meta. Department of Physics and Astronomy. Are there costumes like me, especially in the program? If you can make a file type of the brain communication, you should see. Um, physics yeah. and Astronomy Department at UCLA, right up the road. Uh, so, Mike, it turns out that it doesn't make any difference which direction we. Uh, Landing. So the machine. This is not and this is a single direction from one end to the other. Then you're getting teleported, then K9 is from beginning to end teleported. Of course, if you look only in one direction, it will look like you could place cell. What they did is they looked at that outside the thing and then the cells are clustered right into the direction and angle. Again, the duration, depolarization, so last thing several seconds. We believe that's where this time period comes from. So let me not go into sleep and all that stuff in our theory of persistent activity and how this arises. The mm. campus by the way. Yeah, yeah, this is a multidisciplinary talk. I was hoping maybe I could find the um, audio file. On the 17th, and the answer to that question is no. In rats and mice. Well, anyway, um, if I find it, I'll bring it. But the, the point is this. The, can you make those connections? Let's say you have like 16,000 or 32,000 connections there. Can you, can you make those in one night? Let's say, you know, when you cram for a test, can you interconnect all that material and weave it all together? No, it's not enough time to make those neural connections. So you need time to make neural connections. So the other advantage of reviewing these every day is it gives you time to make neural connections. Um, and so that you can see, you know, things that are seemingly unrelated, but actually are related. Seemingly unrelated means you, you often hear this. Um, you hear this normally in the lower level classes. You don't. You stop hearing it in, in higher level classes. In lower level classes, one of the big complaints that you hear students say is um, that test. That test was awful. That test was nothing like the homework, and nothing like the book, and nothing like the lecture. Have you heard that? Yeah. And, and, and it's probably true. It was nothing like the lecture, nothing like the, nothing like the homework. And so how do you answer questions like that? You answer questions like that by being able to um, interweave all this stuff and then connect you know, seemingly unconnected things which are actually connected. And so um, you, know, you need time to do that. And, um, and so the sooner you do that, the better. We're going to um, take stem cells, turn them into neurons, put them on a chip. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty interesting. Well, <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of weird. weird. Yeah. I'm getting some weird. Well, anyway, uh, what were we looking at? We're looking at um, this one here. So we had iron three sulfate. And what's the other one called?
the other one. Oh. Yeah, very much. So did somebody get it? You need some more time. What did you get? Uh, I got two and three hydroxides. Okay, what's the formula for iron three hydroxide? Uh, two says iron uh, hydroxide is FeOH three. Okay, FeOH three. That's iron three hydroxide. Can you form two of these? Yeah. Okay, we'll wait on the balancing. Let's just figure out what the products are first. And so I'm gonna um, not write the two down just yet. And then what was your other product? It was barium sulfate. Okay, what's the formula for barium sulfate? Uh, yeah. And so in this case, we went from iron 3 sulfate to iron 3 hydroxide. And so basically, all we did was we swapped it. Rather than having iron 3 with sulfate, we're going to pair it with hydroxide. So we got iron 3 hydroxide and barium. Sulfate. This is an example of double replacement. Now, this is not a redox reaction because what happens here is iron 3 stays iron 3. It didn't change. The only thing that changes is rather than being partnered with sulfate now, it's partnered with hydroxide, the other anion. The hydroxide didn't change either. And so we look at barium, barium didn't change, sulfate didn't change, and so we just swap the partners. This is not redox. Redox, when we have redox, somebody has to lose electrons, somebody has to gain electrons. So there are no electrons lost, no electrons gained. And so we call this a double replacement reaction. Double replacement reaction is a type of reaction known as metathesis. Metathesis we'll talk about in more detail later. Okay, then you balance this. Uh, what did you get for how many iron three sulfates? Okay, how many barium hydroxide? Three. And you got two iron two, iron three hydroxides, and how many barium sulfates? Three barium sulfates. We, when we balance these, we don't balance by atoms, we balance by ions. So whenever you have a double replacement, the easiest thing is to count the ions. Two iron ions, two iron ions. Three sulfate ions, three sulfate ions. Three barium ions, three barium ions, and, and six hydroxides. And we have six hydroxides. So that's balance. That looks good. Okay, the next thing we do is we start thinking about the states. All of these are solid. All organic solids, all ionic compounds are solids. But if there's water around, some ionic compounds dissolve in water. So for example, sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is a white solid, but if there's water around, it dissolves in it to form a solution, an aqueous solution. It turns out that if there's water around, this is a green, uh, this is a brown solid, and this, this will dissolve in water to form the aqueous solution. So that would be aqueous. Barium hydroxide is the same thing. It dissolves in water to form aqueous. Barium sulfate and iron 3 hydroxide aren't. Iron 3 hydroxide doesn't dissolve. If I take some iron 3 hydroxide and try to dissolve it in water, it doesn't dissolve to any any significant extent. And so this one will stay solid regardless of how much you know, water. Or maybe a little tiny bit will dissolve, but not enough to call it aqueous. And then barium sulfate's the same thing. Um, barium sulfate doesn't dissolve. And so what is this called? When we take two solutions, mix them together, and we form a solid, it's called solid formation, but we have another name for solid formation, which is precipitation. And so we end up precipitating out 
on these. So we call this precipitation. And these are called precipitates. Precipitates, um, precipitation is PPTION, it's abbreviation, and precipitates are. Okay, so we'll get a precipitate of iron 3 hydroxide and precipitate of iron sulfate. It's going to get kind of a mess. This is two precipitates that are mixed with each other, and so we're going to have a mixture of precipitate. Which sometimes you don't want, you know, sometimes you want clean product. You know, clean product would be maybe just precipitate about one of these. And then we're just left with iron 3 hydroxide, which we can separate using physical means and purify. And so we can get pure. But if we separate this, like if we try to filter it, if we filter this, we're going to get a mix of precipitates. And having a mix of precipitates is a headache. It's a headache. So, uh-huh. The reactants. Um, well, I, let me let me back up a step. Reagents um, can be, you know, uh, reagents are another name for just a, chem, a a chemical chemical reagent, and so they're kind of synonymous. So uh, the reagents don't have to be reactants. Um, they could be other things, but why don't these? Okay, the, if you mix these together, then they'll precipitate. If you keep these separate, that is, you don't add them together, then they won't precipitate. And the reason is, is because of something called solubility. If I, you know, how did I predict this? And unfortunately, this class has lots of memorization. Um, and the next thing you have to memorize after the nomenclature, you're probably thinking, I don't want to memorize anything more after nomenclature because nomenclature is enough to, you know, plenty enough to memorize. But unfortunately, there's more. And so the next thing you have to memorize are called the solubility rules. Solubility rules really are in the next chapter, chapter nine. But you know, the more time you have to memorize, the better. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the solubility rules now. And the solubility rules are simple rules of, that we can use to predict. Why some things precipitate and others don't depends on how strongly they're bonded to one another. And that usually when things are very strongly bonded to one another, they're... They don't like to separate and become precipitates. We'll talk about this more in the next chapter. But since we're on the subject, let's talk about the solubility. The solubility rules in your book are um, good, but they're too long to memorize. There's too many. You know? And so what we're going to use is we're going to use a more compact set of solubility rules. Like, um, there are some really compact solubility rules. Let me see, I just had it up here. This is too long. See that? Too many to memorize. And if they're too many to memorize, then it becomes not very useful. And so they shortened it to this, these five rules. Do you see these five rules here? But that's too short. So this is too short because, and this is too long. Although this, these are pretty decent as well. And so we're going to find a set that seems like this six, six solubility rules, that seems okay. But, and so you're going to find lots of different solubility rules. None of them are perfect. We're going to use the solubility rules in your supplement, which are okay. We get most of what we need. And these are rules. These aren't laws. And so they're exceptions to rules. First thing we look at is a cation. And so we look at the cation and see. 
if the cation is a group one, like alkali metal or hydrogen or ammonium, then um, the salt is soluble. And so all these are soluble. So the first thing I'd look for is group one. There's no group one here. You know, iron's in transition, bearing's in group two. So no group one. So that's not going to help us. Okay, if it's not one of these cations, then I look at the anion because it will be easier to look at the anion than the cations because cations are going to make a very long set of rules. So if I look at the anion, anions next, then I look for uh, these anions. NO3 minus, what's that called? Nitrate? Nitrite? So, NO3 minus is nitrate. C2H3O2 minus. What's that called? Acetate. Nitrates, acetates, and ClO3 minus? Chlorate. Nitrates, acetates, and chlorates. So are, do I have any nitrates, acetates, and chlorates? No. So rule two, rule one and rule two don't apply. Um, these are all soluble. Rule three, if it's not one of these, then I move on to this, Cl minus, Br minus, I minus. What are these names? Cl minus is chlorine, but chloride, chlorides, bromides, and iodides. Fluorides are missing here because if, if we include fluoride here, it's going to get all mess, messy. And so we'll keep fluoride out. Chlorides, bromides, and iodides are all soluble. Except when paired with silver ions, lead 2 ions, and mercury, what's this He2 2 plus called? Is that called mercury 2 or mercury 1? HG2 2 plus. Mercury 2 or mercury 1? HG2 2 plus. It's 1. Yeah, it's 1. This is a mercury 1. It's often confused. So if I had silver chloride, it's insoluble. These are insoluble. Lead 2 bromide insoluble. Mercury 1 iodide insoluble. In fact, any of these cations paired with any of these anions will be insoluble. What does that mean? What that means is something like this. Let's say I had um, this. Um, MnCl2. Do you know what we call that? Is that called magnesium chloride? Is that magnesium chloride? No, it's manganese. Is manganese a fixed charge or a variable charge? Variable. Variable. And so we need the Roman numeral here. If it were fixed charge, we wouldn't need the Roman numeral. This is a fixed charge. Um, well, it's a variable charge. Well, which one manganese is this? This is manganese 2. Do you know what the other charge of manganese is? 3. Yeah, manganese 2, 3. So this is manganese 2 dichloride or chloride? Chloride. Chloride because it's yeah, by itself. Is chlorine ever by, by itself? Yeah. NaCl. Oh, yeah. It's two. The reason it's di is because manganese is two plus. If we had aluminum chloride, it would be three chlorides. If we had titanium four chloride, it would be four chloride. But what happens is this is a solid. All ionic compounds are solid. But if there's water around, we ask, will it dissolve or won't it dissolve? And so what we do is we look at the cation first. It's not group one or ammonium. Then we look at the anion. Well, it's not nitrate, acetate, or chlorate. It is a chloride. 
If it's a chloride, then it's soluble unless it's silver, lead, or mercury. So this is soluble, and this is not silver, lead, or mercury. Therefore, this is soluble. So this is going to go MnCl2Aq, which means if there's water around, it dissolves. What if I had something like... Um, Uh, um, what if I have the uh, PBCL2? What would I call that? Lead yeah, but is lead fixed charge or variable charge? Variable. So I can't call it lead chloride. I have to add a Roman numeral. So it's going to be lead Roman numeral what? Chloride. Again, this is going to be two. So lead two chloride. Now, what are the common charges for lead? Lead is two and Two and four, yeah. How did you know that? Well, um, you know it's position in the periodic table. You know the position in the periodic table, what's the max positive charge on lead? Four. Four. And so it ends up like two and four. So, like all ionic compounds that you're going to, you're going to encounter, they're all solids. And so this is going to be a solid, but if there's water around, Will it dissolve in the water? That is, is it soluble or will it not dissolve? If it, not, if it does not dissolve, we call it insoluble. So is it soluble or insoluble? Insoluble, insoluble which means nothing happens. We're just going to be left with PBCL2 solid. And so it's insoluble, meaning it does not dissolve. We have them um, two. Actually, three designations. S can mean two things. S can mean solid, or S can mean soluble. So S we use for solid or soluble. If it's a solid, it may be soluble, it may not be soluble. And so two totally different things that are unrelated. I stands for insoluble. which just means it doesn't dissolve. And SS stands for slightly soluble. Slightly soluble means eh, a little bit will dissolve, but not much. It turns out none of these are black and white. You know, even if it's soluble, it's not, most things aren't infinitely soluble. Like how many sugar cubes can you dissolve in a cup of coffee? An infinite number? Do you mean infinitely sweet? No, there's going to be a limit, you know? Maybe, what is that limit? Have you, have you ever tried? I think it's like four or something per cup. And then you try to dissolve more and it just won't. You know? So should we, call it in, should we call sugar insoluble or should we call it soluble? Well, we should call it soluble because four sugar cubes is plenty. Um, enough sugar to make it sweet. And so what we have is we have this gray definition of this. The gray definition of this, and this is not black and white, this is not like a law. The gray definition of this is 0.1 moles. If we can get 0.1 moles of sugar to dissolve in a liter of water, then we're going to be happy. That's soluble. 0.1 moles of sugar weighs about 19 grams. So can we dissolve 19 grams of sugar in a liter? Yes. We can dissolve more than that, so this is soluble. So greater than 0.1 moles dissolves in a liter of water. Insoluble means less than 0.1 mole per liter. But, you know, this is too black and white because, you know, at 0.09 it's insoluble, and at 0.10 or 1.1 it's, it's soluble. And so we have this other category, slightly soluble means about 0.1 moles of it will dissolve in a liter of water. I put water in quotation marks because it's a little bit more complicated than that, but essentially it's like this. This is not the state, you know, these are state. And so this would be S, soluble. This would be S, soluble. This would be I, insoluble. This would be I, insoluble. Well, one, two, three. Um, 
Let's go on to four right here. Sulfate. What's the formula for sulfate? SO4 minus? SO4 usually 2 minus. Sulfates, are, these are all soluble. Except, these are major exceptions, they're minor exceptions, which we aren't going to worry about. Except when paired with silver, lead 2, mercury 1, like these, mercury 2, calcium, strontium, and barium. And so, um, an example would be MgSO4, which is a white solid. MgSO4, this solid, will it dissolve in the water? Is it, in other words, is it soluble? And so, yes, yeah, sulfate should be soluble unless it's one of these. And it isn't, because magnesium is not listed. Calcium, strontium, and barium, which are also in group 2, turn out to be insoluble. But this is soluble. So if there's water around, it will dissolve in water to form MgSO4 AQ aqueous. However, if we had something like this, calcium sulfate, is calcium sulfate soluble in water? So it's a sulfate, so we expect it to be soluble, but is it one of the exceptions? Yeah. Calcium sulfate is an exception, therefore calcium sulfate is not soluble. Calcium sulfate is insoluble. And so if we try to dissolve calcium sulfate in water, nothing happens. It doesn't dissolve in water. It just stays as calcium sulfate. <laughs> So here, I have a sulfate here. I have iron three sulfate. So sulfates are soluble unless it's one of these exceptions. So I look, is iron three one of the exceptions? No. And so this is why I knew this is soluble, and therefore I called it aqueous. And then I have another sulfate here. Sulfates are soluble except for these. And barium is an exception. And so that, what that means is barium is not soluble. And therefore, I wrote solid here. So that's how I, took, I can tell that these, this one, this sulfate was soluble, but this sulfate was not soluble because I knew the solubility rules. Solubility rules are important for precipitations because then we can predict what's going to precipitate. Barium sulfate is going to precipitate. It's not soluble, so if we form it, it's going to precipitate it out of solution. Okay, let's move on here. That's number four. We'll go on to number five. Number five. Um, number five is hydroxide. What's the formula for hydroxide? OH minus. Hydroxides are mostly insoluble, so we say all insoluble. Now this is different because earlier we we're saying soluble, soluble, soluble. Now we're saying insoluble. And so hydroxides are going to precipitate, or they're going to form solid, or they won't dissolve in water. Except for these major exceptions here. Except for group 1 and ammonium. Well, that's the first thing we should look at. We should look at the cation and see. So we wouldn't have made it to rule 5 because we would have caught this at rule 1. 
and calcium, strontium, and barium. So here I have a hydroxide, and a hydroxide is insoluble unless it's an exception. And so I look at barium. Is barium an exception? Yeah. Barium is an exception. So barium hydroxide is not insoluble like your typical hydroxide. It's soluble. That's why I wrote aqueous here. If there's water around, barium hydroxide will dissolve in the water. And then this is another hydroxide here. Hydroxides are insoluble. So that's iron 3 hydroxide. Is iron 3 one of the exceptions? No. And therefore, it's insoluble. And that's why I wrote solid here. So, this is how I figured out the state. I figured out the state because I know the solubility rules. Solubility rules is just this pattern. What we'd like to know is, you know, we'd, we'd like to not have to memorize the solubility rules. We'd like to be able to do this uh, using theory, but it's not so easy. to do it in your head, theoretically. There are some broad patterns to this, and we'll talk about that. Yeah. Six, sulfide. Um, what's the formula for sulfide? SO3. SO3. Minus? Okay. Minus? Two minus? Uh, let, me, let me write it out. Sol fine with a D. If I have a D, if I have a T, then you want to write oxygen with sulfur. If I have a D, then chances are it's monatomic. This is S minus S four. S and the charge? Two minus. That's sulfide. That's two minus. Um, these are all insoluble except group one, ammonium, and group two. And so, in this case, we have the entire group two, which would include magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium. That's sulfide. And um, the last rule that we have involves phosphate. What's the formula for phosphate? No. PO4 minus? PO4 3 minus? Yeah, actually, that's right. PO4 3 minus. Phosphate carbonate. What's the formula for carbonate? CO4 or CO3? Four, three, four. CO three. CO three. Charge. Two minus. Phosphates, carbonates, chromate. So the formula for chromate. CR2O3. CRO42 minus. CRO42 minus is correct. 
Phosphates, carbonates, chromates are all insoluble except group one and ammonium. Okay, this is the pattern, but you can simplify this into a simpler pattern too. Obviously, what would be the best is if we understood the theory of what's happening, but sometimes understanding the theory is not it's so easy. You know, it's like um, I just uh, was looking at an article about the cell. You know, um, do, you, do you know everything inside the cell? Let's say you had a, um, because it's this whole thing about aging. You know, this whole thing is uh, if you take a stem cell and you convert it into a, a neuron, is that what they're doing with the neural ones? If you turn it into neuron, right, then you have these. You have all the um, you have all the ingredients to make any kind of cell. If you take a stem cell, you can make any kind of cell. It just has to be. That's called what do they call that? Yeah. It has to be given a job. It has. Yeah. Right. And who, who gives it the job? And it's the um, what is it? A genome? Was that it? No. In other words, your DNA, your, your DNA is in every cell, but you don't make every single protein that your DNA could code for, potentially. And um, there's little packets of information that tells what the cell what to be, become. And those little packets of information called, um, well, it's part of the RNA, but it's the RNA is bundled up in these little packets like that. And, and um, he has a name for these, you know, um, in the information theory of aging. And these little packets come unbundled. And when the little packets come unbundled, then the cells get all mixed up. And he's saying that's what causes aging. What causes aging is your cells um, don't, don't code for the right proteins. So you're talking about the, the end pieces of the chromosomes? Yeah. Those, yeah. those are the... Um, Telomeres. No, not the telomeres. It's uh, uh, it's it's um, the actual packet, bundled packet, and then what happens is they unbundle and then they'll code for specific things. But um, but you know, I was thinking, well, if they know that, then they must know all the proteins in, in the cell. And um, then I read this article because I'm not a, I'm not much of a biologist, so. But it's, it's interesting stuff. And, um, and then I read this article that they're still trying to figure out all the proteins inside the cell. They don't know, you know, what's exactly inside the cell. And then you think, wow, that makes sense because the cell is kind of a complicated mixture. And when you have complicated mixtures, it's very difficult to separate things out. You know, especially if there's very minute amounts. You know, how much protein is in there? We have one, two, three protein molecules. It's very difficult to separate that. Even though you could separate it by physical means, mixtures, it's very difficult because you have so little of it, right? And so that's probably what makes it so hard to determine all the proteins that are inside a cell. You know, and so they're still trying to figure out what all the proteins are in there. Um, there was an article that just came out um, recently in CNN News. We will talk about it some more. But you know the Nobel Prize in Chemistry that was awarded today? Yeah. yeah. To, to um, these very sharp lists, Morgan, Mel, Dell, Nadal, and Carolyn Bertazzi. They won the Nobel Prize. Did you know what? The, I was reading this. What they run it for? Run it for? Is it click chemistry? Yeah, click chemistry. Um, they want it for this one challenging problem. Um, is that when you make complex molecules, 
It involves many steps. Each step creates unwanted byproducts of the thing. And so pretty soon you get a messy mixture like this. This is the messy mixture of precipitates because we get to the next challenge. How do you separate these precipitates from one another? You know, so if you have a mixture of barium um, sulfate and iron three hydroxide, how can you separate it into pure barium sulfate and pure iron three hydroxide? Well, it's not so easy. Sometimes you don't, you know, especially if you have very little of it. Maybe it'll just it'll be some complex mixture. It's like air. Air, though, is not as hard to separate it as other things. Like, you know, and that separation is, is very difficult. And so sometimes you just don't separate it and you have impure chemicals because it's too expensive to separate. And so when we buy chemicals, we buy it at different grades. If it's too difficult to separate, then you just leave it. Leave it as is. And hopefully those impurities don't screw other things up. And so if you have mixtures that are too difficult to separate, I think the intracellular fluid is too difficult to separate, you know, into all the proteins. This is probably why they don't have it fully figured out. You'd think they'd have something like that, you know, figured out, like the total contents of the cell. But that surprised me that the biologists haven't figured it out. Because it sounds, you know, when you hear about certain things, it sounds like they, they understand it quite well, but still a lot of mysterious uh, things in that. You need, you need AI and uh, <clears throat> cryptography to go through all the combinations of solving yeah. and solving. Yeah. Well, even AI, there's another talk at UCLA talking about protein folding by a physicist there. You know, and that's another um, theory of aging, is misfolded proteins. And um, how to, how to, uh, how to either fix the misfolded proteins or to prevent the proteins from misfolding in the first place. And so he's talking about Alzheimer's and other things. So this is very interesting talk as well. But anyway, uh, one way, and this is why this one is a little hard, is not to get that mixture. Because when you have complex mixtures, it's complicated, of course, to separate it. And so if you don't get complex mixtures in the first place, then you don't have to deal with purifying and separating things. And so this is why this one the Nobel Prize because this quick chemistry doesn't generate these complicated mixtures that um, that give you headaches. This quick chemistry just doesn't generate things without the byproduct. So this is them synthesizing something here. It's pretty Nobel there. So it's pretty interesting stuff. You know, and separation, even though we talk about it, like physical separation and chemical separation, it's not so easy. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, let's take a break and we'll start off again after the break. <laughs> Thank you.